Moses has recorded for us. Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him. And he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low toward the earth and worship. He said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your own possession. Then God said, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant. Before all your people I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. All the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I'm going to perform with you. Be sure to observe what I'm commanding you this day. Behold, I'm going to drive out the Amorite before you, and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Watch yourself, that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you're going or it will become a snare in your midst. But rather, you are to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram, for you shall not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. Otherwise, you might make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they would play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and someone might invite you to eat of his sacrifice, and you might take some of his daughters for your sons, and his daughters might play the harlot with their gods, and cause your sons also to play the harlot with their gods. You shall make for yourself no molten gods. You shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abib, for in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt." The first offspring from every womb belongs to me and all your male livestock. The first offspring from cattle and sheep you shall redeem with a lamb. The first offspring from a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest. You shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, that is, the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the Feast of Ingathering at the turn of the year. Three times a year, all your males are to appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover to be left over until morning. You shall bring the very first of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. It came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. 
So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. May God add blessings to the reading, to the hearing, and momentarily to the preaching as well. Until then, let's stand and continue worshiping in song. As you noticed from the reading, we are back into are back in the midst of our journey through Exodus this morning, picking up in chapter 34. We did cover some of 34 uh, a month ago when we were together in Exodus, but I want to back up and begin with the beginning of, end of 33, beginning of 34, and, and work our way through the majority of, of chapter 34, though we'll save the um, last several verses to give attention to next week. Lord willing. This is this section that we find ourselves in is really a remarkable um, portion in the book of Exodus. Uh, if there are two major themes that we are familiar with, or two major stories within the book of Exodus, uh, it would be the giving of the Ten Commandments in chapter 20 and the story of making the golden calf in chapter 32, and then the outcome after that, which is where we are now. I find it wonderfully encouraging and incredibly helpful to see how God responds again and again in the midst of this situation where He has done so much for His people, gone out of His way to redeem them, accomplished so much on their behalf, made so many fabulous promises, and Again and again, they prove to be stiff-necked and obstinate and wicked and so like us. And yet still, we see Him responding with grace, with mercy, offering forgiveness. And that's what we'll see here again today. Even after, now we've seen the immediate aftermath of the fashioning of the golden calf. Moses comes down. He's had enough. He breaks it into pieces. He lays into Aaron. He goes to God on behalf of his people, realizing that he does love them, asks God to blot himself out, to blot Moses out if he won't redeem or rescue or forgive his people. God does. Moses goes back for more and says, this isn't enough. We must have you. And then again, God answers in the affirmative, okay, I'll go with you. And Moses goes back and asks for more. No, we don't just need you to go with us, God. We need you to reveal who you really are, essentially. What you're made of. God, will you expose that to us as your people? That is our great need. And, and really, that's right where we find ourselves in the midst of the story this morning. As we spend a few minutes together this morning, I hope to talk about seven different points from this chapter. So you'll know where I'm headed initially. The revelation of God followed by the repetition in Moses' praying. Then the renewal of the covenant on God's part with the reiteration of our expectations and a reminder of how to worship Him followed by the replacement of the law on the tablets and then the radiating glory of God in the face of Moses. So first, the revelation of God. This comes as a result of Moses asking in the previous chapter, show me your glory. Now again, this is astounding. Redemption has already been accomplished. Which for many of us means pull up a chair, have a seat, we're coasting to the end. 
It's not so with Moses. Not only has redemption been accomplished as they've left Egypt and gone towards the promised land, but deliverance has been obtained. God has promised that they will ultimately reach the promised land, and He's given them everything they need along the way. Every time they were thirsty, He gave them water. Every time they needed something to eat, He provided for them. Day after day, morning after morning, evening after evening, God proved to be their great provider. And he guided them, whether it was a cloud by day, fire by night, he showed them the direction that he wanted them to go. He never once left them on their own, not a single time. And every time they failed to hear him and to follow him, he held out his hand in forgiveness, pulling them back in, drawing them, wooing them from the wayward way that they were headed, pulling them back on the path that he had designed for them, continuing to promise his presence, and yet still with all of that offered, with all of that guaranteed, if you will, on the table from Moses to God, from God to Moses and the people, Moses still says in chapter 33, verse 18, I pray that you would show me your glory. Boldly requesting, God expose more of who you are. Yes, we have all of these things because of who you are, but who are you, God? Essentially, what makes you up? What are you made of? What is it in you that causes you to be so kind, to want to redeem, to be so willing to guide, to be so full in and of yourself that you can be all of our provision? And God, as a result of this bold request from Moses in his incomparable generosity, says, you know what, Moses? I will make all my goodness pass before you. Not a little bit. Not a little bit here and a little bit later. Not even a whole lot, all of it, God says. I'll make my goodness pass right before you. And not only that, I will proclaim loud and clear for you to hear my name before you. I will be gracious to you, Moses. I will show compassion to you. But in the midst of this generosity, God is also wonderfully loving, loving enough to conceal some of his glory. And he explains why he does this at the end of chapter 33. If you have your Bibles open there, you can look at verse 20. God said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. So that's loving. God doesn't say, you know what, Moses, I'm going to give you what you ask for. And Moses sees the glory of God and is consumed and dies. God doesn't operate that way. Because Moses isn't super clear and articulate and exact in his praying, God doesn't just give him what he's asking for. Can you imagine if that happened to us? I mean, if we were required to come with theologically precise praying, with correct motives all of the time, always asking in the right way, you imagine if you're, the answer to your prayers were dependent on you? But we have a great intercessor. It was the same with Moses. God loved him. God knew what he needed and what he was actually asking for. And God explains that there's a place beside him there up on the mountain. And he tells Moses, you shall stand there on the rock and it will come about while my glory is passing by that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then you can get a glimpse of the fading glory as it has gone. Now, it's possible for us to read too much into our Old Testament and to try to turn everything into some uh, prophecy of the Messiah or some typology of Jesus. We don't want to be people who are looking un underneath every stone and around every bush expecting Jesus to be there. However, with that said, we must not shy away from obvious allusions to Christ. And the Apostle has helped us here by clarifying that what is recorded for us here in this story specifically is for our benefit, for our instruction. And the Apostle Paul goes a step forward to say that the rock that was providing for the Israelites as they traveled through the desert was Christ. That the rock that Moses hit and water flowed forth 1 Corinthians 10, 4, that rock was Christ. And here we see the rock showing up again. Stand there on that rock. Hide in the rock. If you are in the rock, 
God says to Moses, if you're a part of that rock, if you're hiding in the rock, then you're safe. Because you are, the last three weeks, united to Him. Here is a wonderful picture in the Old Testament of union with Christ. Christ is the rock and we take refuge there in Him. Hiding from the white, hot glory and holiness of God. If we are united to Christ, if we're hidden in the cleft, covered by Him, we are saved from the holiness of God. Because no one can see Him and live. We move down to verse 6 of chapter 34 and see exactly what was exposed that day. God says He will make all of His goodness pass by. He's revealing His glory to Moses. And to us, we might say, since we have the privilege of looking in on this old story. And what we see happening is that God is exposing His essential character, the substance of what He's made of, the worth and reality of who He is. This is the revelation or the revealing of who God is. It's God allowing that which is concealed to most to be put on display for Moses, and then as Moses records it, for us as well. God summarizes His glory as His goodness. Describing the glory of God is not an easy task. But we can see these different attributes as God acts throughout history and see that this is God exposing, revealing outwardly who He is on the inside. God says, show me your glory. Pardon, Moses begs, show me your glory. God responds, I will show all of my goodness to you. And that's exactly what He does. He puts His attributes on display. The Lord, the Lord God, the eternal, infinite, immutable One, passes by, claiming to be compassionate. Moses knows this already. He has experienced it, that God cares about him. This God, who is compassionate in the days of Moses, when Moses is hiding in the cleft of the rock that day on Sinai, this God has never, ever changed. And if you are His, He cares for you. He still shows this kind of compassion for you in the midst of your situation. This God, in the person of His Son, the writer of Hebrews tells us, sympathizes with our weaknesses. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him, writes the psalmist in the 103rd Psalm. Not only is He compassionate, but He's gracious. And not just giving grace as if depositing a coin in a once and done type thing, but constantly pouring out grace into our lives above and beyond more than we can comprehend, far more than we've ever deserved. And again, something else that Moses has seen, but God reassures him that he is slow to anger. I mean, has that not been proven already? Moses is not slow to anger. He comes down from the mountain. He's at Aaron's throat. He's throwing the tablets on the ground, but not God. He's seated in the heavens doing all of His good pleasure. He isn't ruffled by all of the people on earth, His people, the ones that He's redeemed with His own blood, if you will. He isn't twiddling His thumbs, wondering what's next. No, He sits patient, long-suffering. He isn't volatile or unpredictable or short-tempered. He's patient and loving, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not only that, but abounding in loving kindness. Faithfully, moment after moment, day after day, year after year, keeping His covenant with His Son and with their people. Promising to love and to keep on loving. He's abounding in loving kindness and in truth. His love knows no limits. It is limitless. The love that God has for you, if you are His, knows no bounds. It's beyond what we can think or even imagine. And the description continues. He forgives iniquity, transgression, and 
sin. Again, Moses knows this experientially, and God still sees the need to reveal himself in this way. He's forgiving. Moses has seen the forgiveness offered. Moses has begged God for this forgiveness and seen God answer when he forgave the people for their wickedness. In forgiveness, God isn't just sweeping the sin away and forgetting that it happened, but he is lifting our sin burden from us, removing it from us, placing it on his son, and then quenching it there with the only requirement for the removal of sin, his own wrath, so that we aren't left to bear it. And he doesn't just forgive this kind of sin or that kind of iniquity, but iniquity, transgression, and sin, he forgives all kind, every kind, from moral failure to wrong thoughts to wicked outright rebellion. There is forgiveness in Jesus. And so that Moses, nor us, get unbalanced with thinking that we have some kind of mushy, grandfatherly type guy upstairs, the display of who he is continues. Verse 7, the second portion. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. He will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Is he full of majesty? Is he eternal, infinite, and and immutable? Unquestionably so. Is he full of compassion and does he care about his own? Definitely. Is he grace and does he pour out grace immeasurably on those who are his? Yes. Those who are his? Yes. Is he slow to anger and patient? And long-suffering, of course. Does he abound in loving kindness and truth? Again, without question. And he forgives sin, iniquity, and transgression. Yet, he will not let the guilty go unpunished. The justice of God is just as much a part of his goodness. Remember, that's what he's revealing here. His goodness His justice and His wrath being poured out on unrepentant sinners is just as much a part of Him being a good God as compassion. He would not be good if He didn't treat sinners seriously. So that's the first point. And all that's really review. You probably remember it from a month ago. God revealing himself to Moses and to us. And if you can believe it, this revelation of God, of who He is, of His glory and His goodness to Moses results in Moses praying again. The glory of God being revealed to Moses results in Him being repetitive. Since the golden calf incident, this is the fifth time that we have, at least the fifth time, that we have Moses going back to the throne of God. Initially, he's going to God saying, please don't destroy them, save them. Your glory is at stake in their lives. Save them. He goes to God asking that God would forgive Israel's sin or the other option, to blot his own name from the book of life. Moses went to God in 33, 12, and 13, asking that God would go with him and he would be his guide. You remember there, he goes and says, who's going to lead this people? I can't do it on my own. You must come and help. And then in verse 15 and 16, God God is asked by Moses to be the God of the Israelites, to own them and to make them his own possession. And now Moses is back at the mercy seat again, recycling his prayers, we might say. Asking God, if you look in 34.9, to go along in their midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and asking him to pardon their iniquity and their sin and to take them as his own possession. Things that he has asked 
time and again already. He had prayed to God. He had asked God to do all of these things. And again, when he sees the revealed character of God, he goes back again and says, God, if that's who you are, then you must answer these prayers. Moses was praying based on the revealed promises of God. God had already promised to save his people. He had already promised that he would forgive their sin. He had already guaranteed that he would be their God. He had already told them that they would be his treasured possession forever. And yet still Moses is going asking him to make those things true. Moses knew the promises of God, but they didn't cause him to sit back and relax and say, yes, sovereignty will get us there. Moses wasn't fatalistic. He didn't sit in spite of the promises of God. He prayed because of them, because he had confidence that God was faithful and he would do what he had said that he would do. I wonder how much of our praying is based on the gracious promises and the glorious perfections of God. That's what we see in the life of Moses. Every time God reveals a little bit more of his character, Moses is right back at the mercy seat, suing God, if you will, based on who he is and what he has promised, saying, God, this is who you are. You've just said that you're full of compassion. Prove it. Show us how compassionate you are, God. You've said you would make us your own possession. Come and take over. Dwell in our midst. We've seen and noticed through the past several times when we've been in Exodus together that time and again God heard and answered the prayers of Moses. I wonder if it's crossed your mind that we ought to be even more assured of God's promises to us than those that were made to Moses. Our covenant, the new covenant of Christ's blood, has been ratified with far better blood than that of Moses' covenant. Blood from a better mediator. Blood from a mediator who lives forever, seated and throned in heaven. All the promises of God to you are yes. In Christ Jesus. Why in the world would we find ourselves reserved in petitioning God to hear our praying if we're begging Him to make good on the promises that are ours in Christ? God reveals His glory and goodness to Moses, resulting in Moses repeating His constant prayer as a result of the infinite, seemingly infinite need that they have for God to draw near. And God answers in verse 10, as a result of Moses' prayer, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant before all your people. I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all, nor among any of the nations, and all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing that I'm going to perform with you. The renewal of the covenant. God is reestablishing His covenant with His people. Now, we can go back and connect the dots and see here's evidence that when God says He's compassionate and that He's forgiving and that He's long-suffering, here's wonderful evidence because His people broke the covenant just two chapters earlier. Right? When they fashioned a golden calf and said, this is God, that's pretty atrocious. But here we see Him reestablishing because Moses goes back and said, you promised God. And this is who you are. God reestablishes the covenant with His people. And though He is renewing it, He has the exact same reasoning. He says, this is why I'm doing it, so that all the people will see the working of the Lord. He's still doing it for the same reason, so that His worth and His glory might be exposed or put on display for all to see. For the sake of His name, He saves His people so that all nations will take note of His majesty. He saves His people to display His fame throughout all of the earth. He works mighty miracles in saving His people. And He says here that it's a fearful thing, that which I'm going to perform with you. 
He's already flexed his strength in the ten plagues. He's already displayed his power by drying up the Red Sea so that they cross over dry shod. He's shown his might by sending bread from heaven and quail by day, bringing water from a rock, guiding them cloud by day and fire by night. And yet he notes here that he will continue. He isn't done yet. He isn't the God who just acts and then leaves us. But he says, I will continue marking my people by exerting my strength on their behalf. Making it clear that they are mine. Working such mighty wonders in their life that they are unquestionably mine. That they belong to me. They will be distinct among all the people of the earth because of my working in them. And displaying his strength for all to see is exactly what he's done has he, not, has he not demonstrated his unwavering love and commitment for his own by robing himself in human flesh? By living a life that was perfect and sinless, obedient even to the point of death, even death hanging on a tree, being buried and being lifeless, in the grave, yet somehow the power of God is there as He takes your sin and carries it as far as the east is from the west. And when death can hold Him no more, the stone is rolled away and God raises Him from the dead. There isn't a greater display of power in the history of the world. And that same power is still displayed when God takes you in your lostness and snatches you as a brand from the burning and transforms your life, removing the heart of stone, giving a heart of flesh, changing your whole course of life, the way you think, the way you act, the choices you make, the decisions that you make, setting your feet, pulling them out of the miry clay, putting them on the rock who is Christ, hiding you there in the cleft so that you can see His glory and like Moses, ask for more and more of His divine presence to be evident in your life. God has renewed His covenant. He renewed it with the people of old. And the renewal of the covenant with us that was prophesied in Jeremiah, Ezekiel, that we see happening on the pages of our New Testament, is greater even still. The new covenant of Christ's blood. And as we move forward, we see that not only does God reveal His glory and goodness, causing Moses to repeat his prayers, to which God responds by renewing His covenant, God goes a step further and reiterates the requirements that are ours as a result of being in the covenant. Now, there's a major misconception about this covenant covenant of love that we have with God as believers and the misconception is this that there is a response demanded as a result of the relationship that God has established with us now the wonderful news is that not only is it demanded but it's guaranteed because God knew that this would prove difficult for his people and it has proven difficult for many of us he details the expectation so that there's no confusion as to what the expectations are. He makes clear what their end of the bargain is. He doesn't say, I'm renewing the covenant with you. Okay? Try to act right this time. He isn't vague. He specifically spells out what the expectations are. And namely, they're this in verse 12. Make no covenant with the enemies. I mean, this seems obvious, doesn't it? But Israel's future from this point and your past from where you are now prove that the danger is real, making the warning that we have here from God quite necessary. It's necessary because alliances with other people or peoples meant for the Israelites and means for us alliances with their gods as well. If the Israelites made a treaty with another tribe, then they were legitimizing their deities. There's no way around it. 
And that's why God goes through the trouble here to reiterate what his expectations are. Namely, he just repeats the first and second commandments. Look at verse 14. You shall not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Now, this idea of God being jealous shows up in the second commandment. But if you skip down to verse 17, you see that that's included here in the thought. You shall not make for your... Pardon, you shall make for yourself no molten gods. Detailed instructions for dealing with idolatry. Most of us have a passive approach to dealing with idolatry. God doesn't recommend passivity when it comes to dealing with idolatry. Verse 13, he spells it out. You are to tear down their altars, smash their pillars, and cut down their ashram. There's no passivity there. God doesn't say, move in, give in to them a little bit, tell them they can keep doing what they're doing, you keep doing what you're doing, you just try to stay away from their altars, you try to avoid eating the meat sacrificed to I- that they're sacrificing to their idols. No. God is making clear here that the fight against idolatry is an active fight. There are expectations that we have. Verse 14 clarifies what this should look like based on the character of God. Because he's jealous. Now, jealousy sounds odd when we're talking about God because we think about it in the negative sense. But you understand the positive sense of jealousy as well, right? As a husband, there ought to be some positive jealousy about your wife. If not, you're a terrible husband. But this kind of jealousy is not suspicious or resentful or sinful, but it is fiercely protective. That's the way God is. He's jealous for His own. He's fiercely protective of us. And that's why He expects us to be serious about our end of guarding the relationship. Being zealous to preserve something that is supremely precious. In verse 11 and following here, we see that it's a spiral of idolatry that is happening. And it begins with a mere treaty that offers mutual advantages. I mean, God warns, you're going to be going into these these other territories. And I've cast out the people, but there's still going to be a few leftovers here and there. And you're going to be tempted to just let them slide. It's going to be easier for you, easier for them, no major problems. So it begins with this covenant or treaty that offers mutual advantages. Then, out of nowhere, it seems, there's an invitation to participate in worship, which results, possibly even accidentally, in eating a sacrifice that's been made to a pagan god. And that, God says, is going to culminate in intermarrying with the Canaanites. And pretty soon, every distinction among God's people has dissolved. And the lines have been blurred. And it sounds a lot like modern-day American Christianity, where there's very little distinction between the church and the world. And it all began with an agreement between so-called friends. And it ends in this story with the extinction of Israel as a unique people of God. Again, referring to what the apostle tells us in his letter to the church at Corinth. He has... These things have been recorded so that we do not walk down the same miserable path and end up without this clear, distinct marking of God in our lives. God continues on, if this isn't enough of a warning, the temptation to make your own idols is going to result from these friendly treaties that you're tempted to make. In fact, it's already happened. They've already made a golden calf, and God is reminding them again. It's simply not okay. And if we move forward through biblical history, we see that this has been evidenced, this grave danger recorded time and again. Because the Israelites, once they got to the promised land, they never really drove their enemies out, they were disobedient. They allowed pagan altars to stand. 
to the degree they ended up using them at times. They were seduced into worshiping idols. Their children followed their atrocious pattern, even going further and intermarrying. The next generation, as a result of the intermarrying, led to spiritual adultery. Samson's demise was a result of not heeding the command of God. King Solomon's failure was inescapable due to the disobedience of Israel. And ultimately, because of their failure to keep the commands of God, God removed them all from the promised land. Have you ever considered why the colossal failure happened on the part of the Israelites? Here it is. They refused to destroy the idols that would tempt them to sin. They made covenants with God's enemies and they turned their backs on God. If only they had been as jealous for Him as He was for them. God reveals His glory and His goodness Moses repeats his prayer, God renews his covenant, reiterates his expectation, and then lines out the reminders. Or we might say, God reminds them of the reminders that he's already set in place, namely the three major feasts each year, along with the weekly Sabbath. Verse 18 through 26, observe the Passover, which if we were on a strict church calendar, today would be the beginning of Passover. Palm Sunday, when Jesus came into the city on a donkey. It was on this day that they were singing Hosanna. And on Friday, crying out, crucify him. Their fickleness seen very clearly in our lives. Not only the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, but the harvest, giving time, remembering. Not only has God saved you, but He has provided for you. Or the New Year, the Feast of Ingathering, He continues to bless, and increasingly so. And He gives you rest. You shall work six days, verse 21, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. God knows what the excuses are going to be, and He duly notes them and then deals with them by saying, even during plowing and harvesting. Or this, three times a year, all of the males are supposed to come to the times of worship. God says, I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up there three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. He, God knows what their complaints are going to be. But God, if we go up, someone's going to come in and take our land. And he says, no, I have commanded you and called you to worship me. I'll take care of the land. I will protect it to the degree that no one will even cast a gaze on it and long for it. They're not even going to covet it. And if you don't covet it, you surely don't steal. So they will not come. God is kind enough here to remind them about these feasts, these events of worship that He has instructed them to take part in so that they do not forget where they came from and how they arrived here. And how helpful it is for us to continue to remember that we too were alienated from God in sin, lost in darkness, hopeless. And yet in His kindness, He redeemed His own. And then God continues going a step further, actually doing what He begins accomplishing in the very first part of the chapter, and that is replacing the actual tablets. Remember when Moses went up on the mountain, he's carrying the blank tablets in his hand, and it's after all of this conversation has happened that, that God tells Moses then to rewrite the law, and he wrote the tablet. Pardon, he wrote on the tablets, verse 28, the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. God does not leave his people with any questions regarding their reasonable expectations toward him. He makes it clear to them. 
And then as we continue on, just a couple of comments concerning that last section because we want to spend the majority of our time there next week, Lord willing. But not only does God replace the tablets, but He radiates His glory in the face of Moses. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone. So Moses has been up 40 days. He hasn't eaten anything. He hasn't been drinking anything. He's sitting, basking in the glory of God, full of the substance of who God is. And after he has finished the conversation, he has the stone tablets in hand. He's going back down to put them inside the mercy seat. And he has no idea what's going on, which is, is a wonderful thing for us to note. Because... Most of us, if we spend 40 seconds in the glory of God, we need to go tell somebody about it. Moses is 40 days basking in the glory of God to the degree that the glory of God is reflecting from his very face and he's unaware. He's still trucking back down the mountain, walking in humility and in contrition. And he gets to Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation. They come to him. Moses is speaking to them. They're afraid. They don't know what's going on. Moses figures it out. He puts up the veil in order not to um, cause any separation. But what we see here is Moses speaking with authority. This is Moses. It's not too many days ago that he's complaining to God that he can't even speak. God, you're going to have to send someone else. I can't put two words together that make sense. Okay, we'll send Aaron. Um, Now, Aaron's fallen back into his rightful spot of playing supporting cast, and Moses is the lead man. And here he's speaking to the people, and he's doing it with authority. Yet he doesn't realize that the glory of God is shining forth from his face. So he's walking in immense humility because of being in the presence of God, which causes him to speak with authority. Not a, hey, you listen to me kind of authority, but a, I've been walking with God authority. He didn't have to explain that to them. It was evident. They knew that he had been with God. And when he spoke, they listened, and he told them all that God had said. And again, they committed to walk with God. God, in his remarkable kindness, offering overwhelming evidence of his love and his plan for his people, by marking the face of Moses with his very radiance. It's the way God has worked from the beginning of time. He marks his people. He's chosen us to be distinct. He has said that he will work with greater power in our lives than he did up until this point in Exodus, which is the parting of the Red Sea, all of the plagues, the leading by cloud and by fire, the provision, water from a rock, manna from heaven, quailed by evening. And he promises to continue to mark his people. And this is one way that he does it. By granting them the radiance of the glory of his son. May God help us to walk in this kind of distinction. And to be careful that we don't blur the lines as a result of making friendly treaties with the enemy. God continues day after day to reveal himself and his character, not only through creation, but through his word for those who are humble enough to wake up and open the book. He reveals who he is. And a real honest assessment of who he is in all of his kindness and compassion and love will result in us being very repetitious in our praying. Like the persistent widow going again and again, begging God to hear us on behalf of his name and for the good of our own souls. And he has renewed his covenant, not a second go round of this old covenant with the people of old, but he's given us a better covenant, one that speaks better than the blood of Abel, one that is Christ Jesus, has Christ Jesus as our advocate. He's reiterated his expectations for us, Not only making sure that we see the Old Testament law here, but the teaching of Jesus on the pages of the New Testament, the 
Sermon on the Mount specifically, God has made clear how we ought to act. The requirements are lined out so wonderfully for us of how we ought to be not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but meeting together and stirring up love and good works. He's replaced his written law, not with tablets that were shattered, but he's gone above and beyond and he's written that law on your hearts and there's nothing you can do about it but obey it with his help. And he continues to cause his glory to radiate from his own. For those who are willing to day after day humble themselves and walk with him. And that's our prayer, that we would walk so close and so near that the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ would shine forth in us and among us and through us for his own name's sake and for the good of our souls eternally. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the Lord, that you are compassionate and infinitely gracious, that you are so slow to anger, and that you're patient and long-suffering. God, we thank you that your loving kindness towards us as your children knows no bounds, that your truth is limitless. God, we thank you that you reserve loving kindness for thousands and that we're included in those who receive your loving kindness if we're in your Son. God, we thank you that you forgive iniquity and transgression and sin because we are guilty so often. And God, we thank you that you are holy and just and that you don't look away from sin but you've given us a remarkable substitute, a perfect sacrifice in your Son who will carry our burdens and quench the wrath that is due us. Indeed, he has done so for those who are yours. God, we thank you for the gospel, that you haven't left us to ourselves for our own salvation and you haven't left us wondering how we please you now that we belong to you but you've spelled it out so wonderfully clear in your word. God, give us grace to love you more by obeying you more fully and walking with you more nearly. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Let's stand together. In